Hello and welcome to the Global Dialogue. I'm Shireen Bhan and today we're in conversation with the global CEO of HSBC, Noel Quinn. Noel, thanks very much for joining us here on uh, the channel. Uh, and it's good to have you back in India post the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, so that's where I want to start, Noel. Uh, you know, you've been meeting with clients in Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore. You've met with different people from different sectors, different yeah. verticals, different businesses. What's the sense that you pick up about the strength of the Indian economy and the strength of the India story? An extremely positive sentiment, uh, strong numbers, good optimism for the future and I, I contrast it with the last time I was here pre-pandemic and I think everyone had hope and they were optimistic but there was a question mark will it all become a reality and what I've seen over the last uh, few days talking to customers is it is becoming a reality, very strong growth, the numbers are good, stable political situation domestically, good foundations in place with the digitization of the economy strong consumer demand domestically and increasingly becoming a supplier, a supply base to the world. So very optimistic. You know, I, I'll talk to you about the changes that we're seeing in the supply chain in just a minute. But since you talked about the confidence that you see in the India story and the Indian economy, what does that mean as far as your own plans for India are concerned? Uh, you know, pre-tax profit of a little over a billion dollars. Uh, you've been growing at 10% per annum here in India. Yeah. Uh, are we likely to see a significant expansion here? And what could that mean? I'm really pleased with the growth we've seen. And the great thing is it's been consistent for the last 10 years. And that was one of our ambitions not start, stop, start, stop, into India or out of India, but consistent growth, consist, consistent investment, and be a sort of a, a, a reputable player that people can rely on, we're dependable, and we're there for the long term for India. And that's my plan going forward. Continued investment is definitely coming across all business lines, commercial banking, retail and wealth, and our global banking and markets business. But we'll be there for the long term. It's not just one spurt of investment and then walk away. It's consistent long-term investment. Mm. Possible m and here in India as well in some of those areas that you spoke of. And I know that you want to focus much more on the wealth management yep. side, on the asset management side. Uh, would, that be, uh, would those be areas of opportunity from an m and perspective? Well, I'm pleased well? to say we've already done our first deal with the uh, announced acquisition of our, the asset management business from l &T. We're hoping to get approval on that very shortly. Uh, and that's a good platform for future growth in asset management. And I'm willing to consider further acquisitions should they become available in the future. W you will also be aware that we've a we're already in a joint venture on the insurance business. Um, we've announced that we are in discussions to try and increase our share of the joint venture uh, to 49%. And we'll see how those discussions go. But that's, I think, a measure of our appetite to continue to invest in India. Credit to the team, in the first six months of this year, they've grown the pre-tax profit of India by 22%. Mm -hmm. You know, you talked about uh, the changes that we are seeing in supply chains, and you, uh, you, you believe that this is not deglobalization, but it's re-globalization, yeah. and that's what I want to pick up on. How much of this re-globalization is going to benefit India? Uh, what we are starting to see is, uh, you know, people are looking at nearshoring, so moving manufacturing facilities closer to the home market. We're also seeing this China one, uh, China plus one strategy play itself out. Where does India find itself in the middle of all of this? Well, I think there's a number of factors at play. I think geopolitics is one of the factors. I think COVID made an awful lot of buyers realize they shouldn't be over dependent on any one source of supply or any one particular supplier that they need to have contingency in their supply chain um, and I think resilience is an important factor in supply chains so I asked why I use the word re-globalization I think people are adjusting supply chains for a range of factors and they're sourcing from multiple uh, countries and multiple suppliers and I think India has huge potential uh, to be one of those suppliers going forward we're seeing evidence of that already in that manufacturing plants are starting to be built in India and credit to the government of India. They've created an environment that is stable politically uh, on a domestic front but they've also made substantive changes to the way the economy works. The introduction of GST, the digitization of payments, the digitization of identity make it that much easier for a foreign company to come and establish a base here in India. Mm -hmm. I'll talk about the digitization advantages in just a second, but let's talk about what's happening globally at this point in time. It's an increasingly uncertain environment. Uh, there are challenges on the inflation front, there are challenges on the energy front, uh, and 
all of that is is exacerbating the dilemma that central bankers are faced with. We've seen the ECB move with a 75 basis point hike last night uh, along expected lines. The Fed is basically saying, look, we will do whatever it takes to rein in inflation. Uh, does that, what do you make of what this is going to mean as far as growth is concerned? If there is going to be a recession, how deep do you believe that recession is going to be, at least in some of these key developed markets? I think the important thing is to look at the economic impact on a regional basis because it's different for different regions. I think continental Europe does have a challenge in that there's significant price inflation, but there's also an energy supply concern. The UK and the US have less of a concern on energy supply, more of a concern on energy inflation. Uh, and then if I look at the Middle East, very different economic circumstances, a very strong e economy in the Middle East. And Southeast Asia, very strong at the moment as well. Nobody's going to be immune from an economic slowdown, but I think the impact of it will be different in different regions. Um, and I think you see in Hong Kong, there's gradually a rebooting of the economy there as COVID lockdowns have released. So I think you've got to look at it regionally, not, um, not globally. And here in India, I think India is extremely well positioned to ride out an economic slowdown. It has strong domestic demand. It has good FDI, $83 billion uh, worth of FDI last year, strongest ever. Um, it had, it's starting to build up good trade flows. So I think India is well positioned to ride out an economic slowdown. Mm -hmm. And, you know, th the question then is what happens to fund flows and will fund flows continue into markets like India? And, you know, we're often uh, sort of equated with other emerging markets as well. Uh, do you believe that with interest rates tightening the way that they are at this point in time, uh, that could potentially impact fund flows into markets like ours? I think India is in a good position relatively for positive fund flows. And I think that's all credit to the way the economy is being managed. Uh, during COVID and post-COVID, rapid response in the build-up to COVID in India, rapid response post-COVID to adjust back to more normalized economics. On interest rates, by the way, it's good to see that normal monetary economics are starting to re-emerge. Zero percent interest rates is not a normal monetary policy. Now, we're all concerned about them having to rise too fast, too high in response to inflation. I'm hoping that and have a belief that some modification will take place in the demand curve because of inflation and that maybe rates won't have to go quite as high as we currently think because demand will adjust not because of rates but because of inflation and I think there is some evidence of that starting to emerge. In terms of India I think it's really well positioned as an investment market and future FDI coming into India. Mm -hmm. You know, you said that we might see demand taper on account of inflation and hence the expectation that we are going to see significantly higher interest rates may not pan out. What would be uh, the, the rate that you are at this point in time looking at? What do you believe we are going to see the Fed move to? Well, listen, it's very hard for me to predict what the Fed will do, but I think everyone's baked in a pretty certain future of at least 4%. It could go higher and many people believe it will. I think we're going to have to see how the demand curve changes over the next few months. Uh, but certainly we can be looking at 4% interest rates in, from the Fed and potentially higher than that. Mm. You know, let's address inflation. Let's talk about what that means for a market like the UK, for instance. Uh, the British Prime Minister, the new British Prime Minister has started off by capping energy prices or energy bills for two years now. Uh, and that is likely to have a significant impact on reining in inflation as well as providing some degree of liquidity uh, to the end consumer. How do you see this playing itself out? And would energy shocks be the, one of the top risks uh, facing the global economy today? Yes, I do believe that to be the case, and I think it's a very positive move that the new Prime Minister made yesterday. The price inflation in the energy sector in the UK wasn't percentages. It was four or five times higher, potentially in the next few months, than it would have been a year ago. And for consumers and small businesses, that price inflation of four or five times higher is not sustainable. It would have had significant neg negative impact on the economy. And it was important to address that because that, I think, was the biggest risk facing the UK economy going forward. Yes, it has a positive impact on inflation. That hopefully should reassure markets. And the extra fiscal deficit as a consequence of that action 
is manageable. Um, but it was, the, uh, it was a very positive move yesterday. Since you talked about this divergence that we're seeing uh, and how it's going to play itself out across different markets, at this point in time, Asia, India in particular, look relatively stronger or better poised in comparison to some yeah. of the developed markets. Uh, would this be, as many are calling it, the Asian decade or the Asian century? What are your thoughts on that? I think it's particularly strong for India. Uh, I mean, I, I, the visit I've been on this week, I think what I'm seeing is India is economically well managed, politically stable, domestically, infrastructure being built out to create platforms for growth, and the business community very innovative and very action, action orientated. India is relatively really well positioned. I think Asia generally is. We've got to remember Asia is a huge consumption market. Uh, so yes, it's going to be impacted by the world but it has its own engine for growth in very large domestic consumer markets. And I think that will give it some resilience that maybe some other markets don't have. Mm. Yes, I, I think the, uh, the perception that Asia was essentially the factory for the world, but now also increasingly the consumption hub of the world, I think that uh, that's playing itself out. But let's talk about China. And what we have seen is with the lockdowns in play, uh, that has impacted growth. We don't know how long the zero COVID policy is going to last. There's been other changes as well, the crackdown on tech companies, for instance. And of course, the debt concerns continue. What's the view and the take on China at this point in time? Medium term, long term, still strong economic growth. Um, again, a huge consumption market. A policy framework that is trying to drive that consumption growth into the GDP growth. Um, still a supplier to the world, but with more of the economic growth coming from the domestic market. Um, and I think they will manage through the current COVID situation and find a path out of that. And therefore, we're still very positive on the long-term economic prospects of China. Um, I think there were some industry segments that needed some correction. The correction has been faster than I think all of us expected and more decisive. Again, I believe once that correction has been done, it will return to a platform of growth. So again, we're investing in China the way we're investing in India, the way we're investing across Asia. From HSBC perspective, I see four strong pillars of growth. India, Singapore, Hong Kong, China. And HSBC is investing in all four markets to really get the four pillars of Asia, and Singapore particularly, as a route to Southeast Asia. And that's where we're investing in all four markets at this point in time. We recently completed an acquisition of an insurance business in, in Singapore to build out our wealth and insurance capability, merge that business with our own, and build a much more uh, solid platform for growth in Singapore. Mm. You know, you talked about these four pillars, but I just want to labor a little bit more on, on China. Uh, and given the geopolitical concerns as well as the geopolitical flashpoints at this point in time, uh, at least as far as FDI is concerned, do you believe that that is going to get impacted when we talk about China? Uh, listen, we've faced geopolitical challenges and geopolitical situations for the 157 years of our history. Geopolitics is a factor of being an international business and is a factor of being an international bank. We navigate that. Will it impact FDI flows, the geopolitical situation? Potentially, yes, it will. But we go through cycles, and as an international bank, we've been managing complex geopolitical situations for 157 years, and we will continue to do so. You can't be an international organization and think there aren't geopolitics in, in play. Now, I, I would imagine that, uh, that that's been the, the nature of the business. Uh, but, you know, how different is the geopolitical environment today than it was, say, five years ago? Because, uh, you know, you're seeing different kinds of flashpoints at the same time. There's Russia, Ukraine, there is China, there is what's happening with the U.S., there is Taiwan and China. So there's different flashpoints playing out together at the very same time. Does that make it increasingly more complex and challenging? Clearly, it's more complex, but there have been similar flashpoints in the past in other parts of the world, and you navigate your way through them. I always come back as a bank to my customers. Uh, and if I think about my own dynamics, what am I seeing, and why do I use the word reglobalization? If you look at our international account opening activity for businesses in the last six months, 
That activity is up 13 percent. So there is no deglobalization in the way that we imagine it no, to be. That activity was up 15 percent last year. The year before it was up 13 percent through COVID. International activity, despite COVID, despite geopolitics, despite shifting economic platforms and relativities, it's still happening. Our trade business was up 15 percent in the first six months of this year. Our trade business into India, I think, is up around about 8 percent. Sorry, we have an 8 percent market share of, of, of export activity in India. So my customers are still internationally orientated. The nature of their international business is changing. They're diversifying their supply chains. They're building in more resilience. They're sourcing from different parts of the world, not completely re-globalizing, but in part re-globalizing. That is a factor. And as an international bank, we're very much focused on helping our customers navigate a complex international world. We'll take a break here on the Global Dialogue and return in conversation with the global CEO of HSBC. Welcome back. You're watching the Global Dialogue and we're in conversation with the global CEO of HSBC. And I know that you've been asked this question and uh, you've answered it to say that you don't believe that sacrificing certain businesses at this point in time makes sense, that the future uh, should continue to look like where the bank currently is, of course, expanding your various businesses. But uh, if, if there were to be more investor pressure, uh, do you think that that is an eventuality uh, at some point that you are going to have to acknowledge and deal with? No, I don't believe that's the case, and it's not the investor pressure I'm feeling. Um, our institutional investors um, believe in our international model. Our customers believe in our international model. And the facts support it. 15% growth this year in international activity, whether it's trade or overseas account opening, is a supporting piece of evidence. Um, so I believe we have a good business model. It's worked well for 157 years, and it will continue to work well going forward. So while, while you don't envisage a split of any kind, but what changes, if any, are you likely to make uh, within the bank? Uh, and especially, you know, on, on being able to open into new markets, uh, on digitization, for instance, which is, of course, a big theme that most people uh, have sort of accelerated their moves towards digitization post-COVID. You know, some of those aspects, how are you dealing with them? Digitization is critical. Uh, last year, we processed... $660 trillion of payments on behalf of our clients, 98% of which were fully digitized, straight through processed. We're one of the biggest payments organizations in the world, one of the biggest foreign exchange houses in the world, and the biggest trade bank in the world. So you can't be that organization and not be committed to digitization. You can't cope with that volume in a resilient fashion if you don't commit to digitization. I think it's a massive unlocking of economic potential and that's evidenced here in, in India. Uh, and I applaud what the government have done in building a digital architecture for the economy by the government to allow the businesses of India and the world to create business models that would not be possible without that digitization. Mm -hmm. So we're fully committed to it. Um, we're also looking to do the same thing, and I think we've underinvested in digitizing our global wealth proposition, and that's the journey we're now on. We've done a lot on com corporate banking. We're now doing much more on international retail and international wealth management, and there's a s significant investment program going into that of, I think, around about $2.5 billion over the next few years to achieve a truly international retail and wealth management business. Mm -hmm. You know, you talked about uh, foreign exchange, uh, and let me ask you about what's happening as far as the currency markets are concerned. Do you believe that the dollar strength, the kind that we are seeing today, is likely to continue? At the moment, I would say so, yes. Uh, dollar is very strong, but that's driven largely by the interest rate yield curve at the moment. Also good economic prospects over the medium term in the U.S., and that is a challenge for other markets. But yes, I do believe there will still be a strong dollar. M&A mm -hmm. activity, do you believe that 2023 is uh, uh, almost halfway through 2022, but 2023, do you believe that we're going to see a tapering down of M&A activity or do you believe that that's likely to continue? I think when you have this level of economic uncertainty and you have a readjustment of the monetary policy and higher interest rates, that's going to have an impact on M&A. It's going to have an impact on IPOs. 
because everyone's got to revalue the economy going forward compared to an economy that was based upon 0% interest rates. And some of the M&A activity that may have been possible with low interest rates will have different economics associated with interest rates, uh, whether it's 2%, 3% or 4%. I don't think that's unhealthy. One could argue we had a little bit of a false market over the past five years, three, four, five years, because of artificially low interest rates. And some business models were attractive, you know, on an MPV basis, when you look at 0% discount rate. Yeah. When you look at a 3% discount rate or a 4% discount rate, it's going to have an impact. You know, you, you've visited Bangalore here in India, and of course, a large part of the Indian startup ecosystem and the startup story is also linked to the digitization theme. What do you make of the Indian fintech story? Oh, it's huge. Uh, it's exciting. I mean, uh, we personally have, uh, we now bank around 1,000 startups here in India, uh, and I think we've got around about 43% of the unicorns as, uh, as clients, which is great, and credit to my team for doing that. They've done that silently. Uh, in a determined manner and in a very professional manner. And I met a number of them yesterday. I met a number of the fintechs and unicorns yesterday. Uh, very exciting. What I love about it, huge intellectual property in their thinking, followed with great execution, and building upon the platform that the government have created on the payment trails, the digital identity, the, the enhanced bureau capability. And I think what you've got is very innovative business leaders but also very strong execution models. And that's a powerful ingredient. Um, exciting, and we'll continue to support them in every way we can. Mm. Including collaborating and with the them way, and partnering with them? with them? Collaborating and learning from them. <laughs> you know, we've got to keep learning. We're a, we're a 157 year old institution. Uh, I learn from what they're doing, and hopefully we can help them in ways that, you know, from our history and experience, we can help them grow as well. Mm. But uh, collaborate with them, yes. Learn from them, yes. Bank Buy them. them. Bank yes. them, definitely. Buy them, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but could that be something that you would want to consider? Uh, listen, we, we, have a t we always look at opportunities to collaborate, grow, learn. And we have looked at acquisitions in the digital space and the fintech space. But let's see where we go. I'd rather be having a mindset of collaboration and support. And we'll go from there. So I see you today and you said that, look, geopolitical flashpoints are not new and this is not an unusual scenario. Uh, what are the key challenges or the key risks on your dashboard that you're looking at today? What, what really worries you? Uh, clearly, geopolitics is one of the factors you consider. Economic growth is now a new and emerging challenge and I think we've got a position for that and the negative impacts that the inflation curve could have on businesses and people. We've got to be supportive. And then you always worry. I run a large global organization um, around over 60 countries in the world. You always have something high on your agenda, and there's always something you need to focus on. From my point of view, for HSBC, I'm as focused on continuing to improve the performance of the bank, improve its returns, improve its profitability, and improve its customer experience. So, I got a huge investment program. I want to make it happen. And the 12% return target on track? Yes. I wouldn't have said it if I didn't believe that we can achieve it. Um, and that's important. That's the first time in 10 years this bank will have reported a 12% plus return next year if we can deliver that. And I am determined to deliver it. And that is an important milestone. And I believe that isn't purely predicated on rates. If you compare the yield curve today to the yield curve, the last time the yield curve was at that position, our returns next year will be at least 400 basis points higher than the returns we had when the yield curve was here before. That's because we've improved the operating performance of the bank, the underlying leverage of the bank and the operating leverage. So the returns we get in is normalized rate. For me, normalized rates in a banking world is two to two and a half percent. I don't think any bank should be, business model should be predicated on enduring three and four percent interest rates. I believe it's right to have normalized interest rates two to two and a half. And I believe at that level, with the operating leverage we've created, we can deliver 12 percent plus. Mm -hmm. You know, let me end by asking you about some of the sort of new trends and uh, that have been around for a while. Uh, what do you make about 
the recent sort of fall that we are seeing in cryptos and do you believe that this is a story that's now on its way out or it's a story that is going to see another revival uh, you know the move towards uh, payments being digitized completely and we're talking about central banks looking at digital currencies and so on and so forth what is that going to mean how does that change the mix for bankers like you well listen I already I would class myself already as a digital payments house at 98 percent of 660 trillion you're digital um, I'm a fan of CBDC I think there's a good use some good use cases for central bank digital currencies um, particularly cross-border remittances for personal customers and particularly SME cross-border payments <clears throat> I think a CBDC architecture could help those two use cases tremendously crypto I think I've made my views fairly clear uh, I'm as a bank we're not getting into the crypto world uh, crypto trading crypto exchanges I do worry about the sustainability of the valuations of crypto and I have done for a while I'm not going to predict where it will go in the future uh, I, one of the problems with crypto for me is it's hard to predict where it's going to go in the future it's too volatile and as a product I question the suitability of that product for many of the consumers in the marketplace today so that's why HSBC is more negative on crypto than other banks the underlying architecture and digital capability that underpins crypto I think has got great use cases uh, distributed ledger technology fantastic use case in tokenization of capital markets uh, so we're investing in tokenization we're investing in CBDC but I'm not bringing crypto product to the market for our clients because I worry about the volatility. Noel, thank you very, very much for speaking with us on CNBC TV 18 on the Global Dialogue. We wish you the very best of luck and look forward to seeing you back here. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Well, with that, it is time for us to wrap up this special edition of the Global Dialogue. We'll see you again. Till then, from all of us here, goodbye. Many thanks for watching.